and welcome to Return to Regalia, an Underland Chronicles reread podcast. I'm Una, and today I'm joined by my friend Lily. Hello. Lily, tell us how you first got involved with the series. So I uh, was a big reader when I was a kid, and I'm from um, Oregon, and in Oregon we had this thing called Oregon Battle of the Books, or OBOB, which was basically this, like... I guess competition where you would like make teams of like three or four kids and read a set list of books and then you had to like answer questions about them. I did not find fame through that, (laughs) Um, but I did find a lifelong love of Gregor the Overlander. So that was like in fifth grade, I think I read Gregor the Overlander and then I read the whole series and then I reread it and then I reread it again, but it's been a long time since I read it and so it's been fun to like reread um and I remember like less than I thought I did about it so that's been cool yeah that's exciting Mm -hmm. I also read it for the first time in fifth grade but yeah today we're gonna be covering chapter 12 and depending on time maybe chapter 13 but 12 is a really beefy one so we're gonna see how much we can get through So where we last left Gregor, he was in the middle of trying to convince the Regalian Council to let him bring boots on his quest, and a woman on a bat crashed into the meeting to announce that the rat armies are on their way. This makes everyone jump into action, and the scene becomes chaos. Gregor goes to the balcony of the High Hall, where Vicus is giving orders, and he sees that the whole city is preparing for war. Vicus tells him they'll be leaving soon to rescue his father because they think this is the war foretold in the Prophecy of Grey, and the only way they're going to survive is if they start the quest and fulfill the prophecy. I just think it's so interesting, like, how tied to the prophecy he is. Like, I know that y'all talked about that, like, in several episodes before this, but, like, the, the fact that everything goes back to the prophecy is just, like, really funny to me, and I keep thinking about what you were talking about, how, like, about how, like, the prophecy could mean a lot of things, but he's just, like, so tied to it. Yeah. And that'll come back later in this chapter, too, but... I've been thinking a lot about it, too, just because Vicus is really gung-ho about the prophecies, and I wonder if that is actually less of a typical Regalian thing and more of just a Vicus thing. Yeah. Like, I'm wondering if everyone else is also, like, Vicus ease back a little. Something tells me that there are some real fanatics, but yeah, Vicus is one of the characters that most ties everything back to the prophecies or tries to make everything about the prophecies. Yeah, definitely. So Vicus tells Merith to take Gregor to the museum and let him choose whatever he thinks he might need on the journey. Side note, that's not super relevant, but it is interesting. This is when Vicus gets distracted by war stuff and says, here is the delegation from Troy. Yeah. So I guess Troy is one of the, like, regalian suburbs, kind of like the fount we learn about in the second book. But I don't think we ever learn about Troy. Yeah, I didn't remember that at all. And I thought that that was interesting because, like, you know, there are all these, like, Greek references. Yeah. I So I'm interested in what people think Troy is because we literally never hear about it again. And I also think it's, like, interesting to think about all these delegations showing up. I, it definitely feels, um, it makes sense why as a kid, like, I didn't recognize, like, what was happening so much. Because the way it's written is, like, it's obviously written for children. But, like, what is happening is, like, literally world-altering right. for the Underlanders. Everyone from the Underland is coming together. And mm-hmm. also, side note, I would love to learn more about the political system and, like, all the different delegations. For real. Gregor follows Merith to a large chamber filled with shelves that contain random junk that's fallen from the Overland. And I did just want to talk about the museum because it comes back every book. Yep. And it's, along with the prophecy room, it's one of the best places in the palace. Oh, it's my favorite. It's so cool. I remember being like so interested because I love stuff. I love antique stores, but I also love museums. Like, yeah. you know, in our, our version of museum. But it sounded really cool. Yeah, I love the idea that the Regalians don't have any context for what the objects are that come Mm -hmm. from the Overland. So they just save everything. Like, I think they talk about there being 
baseballs and things. Yeah, and like car tires, I think. Yeah, like a lot of it is garbage. Mm -hmm. But to them, it's like a relic of this world. It's like if aliens were just dropping trash on our planet, we'd keep all of it, even though the aliens think it's trash. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because they don't seem like overly interested in like what the overlanders are doing or like yeah they don't even th seem to think that highly of them right and yet they're like keeping all this stuff like yeah it's kind of interesting yeah there's never anyone else in the museum when <laughs> gregor is there mm -hmm. so i wonder how important it really is and they let gregor take things from the museum yeah so it's not like they're trying to maintain the collection or whatever yeah I wonder if they have a catalog for it. Ooh, I want to meet the archivist <laughs> yeah. who is in charge of keeping this museum. Anyway, Gregor wishes he had time to look around because he thinks some of the stuff in there could be hundreds of years old, but he makes himself focus on what's most important. Merith gives him a leather pack and he ends up loading it up with a flashlight and batteries, reasoning that light will be the thing that he'll need most on his quest. He also finds a hard hat with a built-in light on the front, which he puts on his head. Merith says they need to go, and right before they leave to get boots, Gregor finds a can of root beer and adds it to his bag, just because it's his favorite drink and it reminds him of home. This is so cute. <laughs> I think it's so cute too, especially because he just adds it for fun, and he even admits, like, I don't need this, it's just nice to have, but then it comes in handy later. Yeah. Yeah. And the fun thing is that I don't remember how it comes in handy, but I do remember that it comes in handy. Um, so I'm hoping that me not remembering stuff as much as like your other guests is like interesting um, rather than like weird. But yeah, of course. <laughs> um, I, what I do remember is being like so impressed that he thought to like look through all the electronics to get batteries for yeah. the flashlight. When I was a kid reading this, I was like, that is so smart. Like, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Because, I mean, he has no idea how, like, long this is going to take. He can't even comprehend the vastness of it yet, I don't think. So, like, I just thought that was really cool. I feel like at 11 years old, I would not have the foresight to think, like, I should get more batteries in case no. these don't work or in case they run out. And I wonder, like, how that would change, like, if kids nowadays, like, read this book. Like, they probably would even have less foresight to think of that because, like, we have chargers, you know? You're so <laughs> right, actually. It'd be interesting to, like, see, like, how many kids are reading it now. Because this book is actually 20 years old this yeah. year. That's crazy. It's really wild. Yeah, and, like, obviously the author, Susan Collins is, like, really well known, but... This series is still not very well known. Yeah. For whatever reason. I don't know. Yeah, it's always been so puzzling to me how this hasn't taken off the way other middle grade fantasy series have. Yeah, because it's not like middle grade hasn't... this. I know this is a side, side tangent, but it's not like middle grade like isn't popular. Right. Like even among like young adults and like adults, you know, exactly. especially in the past like five years, I feel like a lot of middle grade books have really become mainstream. Yeah, and I feel like as a genre, it's really taken off. Mm -hmm. Even just like, it has so many similarities to like Percy Jackson. Yeah, You'd think that if everyone knew that Suzanne Collins had a middle grade book series that is comparable to Percy Jackson, they'd be all over it. But this book just hasn't gotten that recognition yet. Yeah, and I still don't understand how, like, after the success of The Hunger Games, this wasn't made into a movie or, like, a TV show. Like, right. Similar to, like, Percy Jackson in that it's, like, perfectly laid out to be, like, a series of movies or something like I know, that. I mean, right? I would prefer it to be a TV show. Obviously, um, yeah. But... <laughs> Yeah, it's just really interesting. I wonder, like, why it, like, slipped through the cracks. Yeah, yeah. Because when I tell people about this series, they have no idea that Suzanne Collins wrote other books. And it's just wild that no one has thought to look at her other works, mm -hmm. aside from Hunger Games. Yeah. No, that's a good tangent. I like it. So, Merith and Gregor find Boots in the nursery having a tea party with some Underlander toddlers, and Gregor almost changes his mind about taking her along, but then he remembers the palace is about to be under siege. Dulcet helps get Boots in her pack on Gregor's back and attaches a bundle of baby supplies. I love Dulcet. Dulcet is 
so good she comes in handy so much she's always thinking ahead (laughs) always taking care of boots and i like that she's just like so genuinely like empathetic she's really sweet Mm -hmm. especially in a series where so many characters have their own agendas Mm -hmm. dulcet is really just here to be kind and caring Mm -hmm. (laughs) she's such a breath of fresh air also she's 15 yeah (laughs) yeah i don't think i ever recognized the fact that she's like a teenager Mm -hmm. i think when i read this as a kid i just thought of lusa and gregor as the kids and then literally everyone else as an adult but like Howard and Dulcet and Henry are teenagers. Mm -hmm. Dulcet says goodbye and Boots tells her, see you soon, because that's how Gregor's family always says goodbye to each other. Don't worry, I'll be back. See you soon. This see you soon thing comes back a few times in the series. And I wonder if this is something that Gregor's family says because of Gregor's dad disappearing. Mm. Like, I wonder if they're trying to reassure each other that they'd never leave forever on purpose. So they always say, see you soon. Yeah. Dulcet tells Gregor, fly you high, Gregor the Overlander. And this is the first time we hear the phrase fly you high, which the regalians use to mean goodbye and good luck. And we hear it countless times in this series, but this is the first instance of it, which is really fun. Yeah, that's really cool. I didn't realize that. (laughs) They go back to the high hall, and Henry is there hugging a, quote, painfully thin teenage girl who is crying. We learn that this is his sister, Nerissa, and she's telling Henry that her dreams have worsened and that a terrible evil awaits him. I don't think we ever find out if she's older or younger than Henry. I think that... Later in the series, when Nerissa has to be queen, they say that she's 17, Mm. and Gregor thinks that Henry is 16 in this book. So Nerissa and Henry could be the same age. Like, they could be twins. We don't even know. Yeah, Yeah, and this is another thing where, like, I remember that there's a lot to do with Nerissa, but I don't remember what it is. Yes! Um, That's so exciting. I love that you can kind of just like experience the book <laughs> books for the first time again. Yeah, like it's funny that you can read something so many times. Yeah, it's fun. I get to experience it again. So great. <laughs> Nerissa is one of the most fascinating characters actually in the series to me because to me, I think she's the only character who seems to have legitimate magic powers. Like this series definitely has fantasy elements like giant talking animals and whatnot but there's nothing in these books that i would describe as magic Mm -hmm. unless you want to get into like gregor's rager powers Mm -hmm. or his echolocation but even that is like i wouldn't call that magic yeah but nerissa seems to be able to legitimately tell the future which is something that is called into question in general in this book series, especially relating to Sandwich. But we never get an explanation for how Nerissa knows the things that she knows. And she never is wrong, I don't think. She's like the most interesting character in this whole goddamn book series. Yeah, I can't remember like exactly right, but I just remember being super fascinated by her and like... Definitely, there's, like, a lot of mystery surrounding her. Yeah. By the way, Nerissa is another Shakespeare name. There's a character named Nerissa in The Merchant of Venice, which is another play that I haven't read. Have you read it? No. Yeah. I don't know anything about it. In my episode about everyone's names, I'll try and figure out if there are any parallels between the characters. So Henry tells her, Do not distress yourself, Nerissa. I have no plans to die. (laughs) Wah, wah. <laughs> Henry gets on his bat and Nerissa comes over to Gregor. She gives him a roll of dried animal skin and leaves to go lean on a wall for support. Gregor opens the scroll and sees that it's the prophecy of Grey written out for him, which is weird because he was just thinking about how he'd like to read it again. Someone next to Gregor tells him that Nerissa has the gift. At first, Gregor thinks they're a boy, and then he realizes it's Luxa, and she's gotten a haircut since he saw her last in the council meeting. Can I just say real fast, though? Yeah. That I I really like that Nerissa says there are evils beyond death. Ooh. After Henry says, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not planning to die. She's like, there are evils beyond death. That is pretty killer. Um, yeah, I... 
I thought that line was just so cool, and I couldn't pass up an opportunity <laughs> to say it out loud. No, that is a good one. Um, but yeah, Luxa caught her hair. Yes, I always <laughs> thought this was so cool as a kid, like, because at the beginning of this book, she's described as having this, like, really long braid, like, it's mm -hmm. so long she can tuck it into her belt, and it's such a princessy thing to have, like, long flowing hair, but then immediately when she's like, it's quest time, she has no trouble cutting it off. I wonder if it's almost like a rite of passage or something, like for warriors, like, Ooh. like particularly, I guess, female warriors, since they haven't talked about like men having long hair. No, I don't think so. It'd be cool to look for like other instances of like hair, <laughs> like, you know, descriptions yeah. of hair. We don't get a lot of physical descriptions of people in the these books. Mm -mm. But yeah, that's interesting to think about. When Gregor asks Luxa about it, she tells him long hair is dangerous in battle, and he says, that's too bad. I mean, it looks good short, too. Luxa laughs and says, think you my beauty is of any matter in such times? Gregor is embarrassed, but Henry just jokes that Luxa looks like a shorn sheep. For a moment, Gregor almost feels like he's among friends, but then he thinks, these people had a long way to go before he could consider them friends. Luxa asks about his hard hat, and Gregor flicks on the light to show her. He can tell she's itching to try it, but doesn't want to ask, and he decides even though they aren't friends, it'd be better if they got along, so he lets her check it out. This is so cute. I know, right? And also, like, just everything about this scene is so cute. The bit about the sheep, too. Mm -hmm. Like, Henry saying she's shorn as a sheep, and then Boots saying, ba ba, sheep says ba. Yes! And then, like, Henry's laughing, and Boots is like, sheep says ba. Like, yes. she's just, like, <laughs> defensive about it. And then when Gregor gives Luxa the hard hat, like, perfection. That's all I have to say. <laughs> it really is a great scene in the middle of all of this chaos of trying mm -hmm. to take off for the quest. They get this little moment of like, oh, we're just kids joking around. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the first hint of them becoming friends. Mm -hmm. It's also perhaps like indicative of how often or like how regular war is in their society that they can just like make jokes and stuff. And I feel like Gregor doesn't grasp like how real it is yet. So maybe that's why he can make jokes. I mm -hmm. don't know. Yeah, no, I like that. Luxa tries to be chill about it, but she's clearly fascinated by the light switch. She asks how it produces light without heat, and Gregor explains that it runs on a battery. Luxa reveals that Vicus has told her about electricity. So I was wondering how much the Regalians know about electricity, and how much is known by royalty versus peasants. Like, does Luxa get to learn about electricity because she and Vicus get to sit around and read history books and everyone else is like working so they probably don't know about electricity or is this something that all regalians learn about like what's the school system how is information dispelled I have so many questions <laughs> how many people like get to go to the museum and like see electric things you're right because we never really get the perspective of, like, the everyday regalian. Mm -hmm. We kind of just see in the palace. I have so many questions about regalia. <laughs> How, like, equitable is it? That's what I'm thinking. Is it similar to how we think of, like, medieval kingdoms and the royalty get to do whatever they want and everyone else is kind of, like, in perpetual servitude to them? Or is it more egalitarian than that we never really learn yeah yeah <laughs> and like what would an american like gregor like think to like that would have been a really interesting perspective or like scenario i guess to see i think at one point rip red tells gregor to tell luxa and henry that his people fought a war so they didn't have to answer to kings <laughs> and then that's how we learn that Rip Red, like, reads books or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's also really interesting that because the Regalians are descended from people who came from, mm -hmm. like, Victorian England, mm -hmm. they didn't see the American Revolution. I don't know. That's just really funny to me. <laughs> yeah. Henry jokes that Luxa will begin a new fashion with the hard hat and balances a torch on his head. 
She lies and tells him his hair is on fire, and he freaks out, which makes her laugh. They remind Gregor of himself and his sister Lizzie. Vicus interrupts their teasing and tells them to mount up. Gregor gets on Euripides with Vicus, and notices that Solovet and Merith are also leaving with them. They take off, and Gregor gets excited about the possibility of getting his dad back. The narration says, They would rescue him and take him home, and his mother would smile, really smile again. And there would be holidays to celebrate, not to dread, and music, and... And he was getting ahead of himself. He was breaking his rule right and left, and in a minute he would stop, but for that minute he would go ahead and imagine as much as he wanted. I love this paragraph. Yeah. Because he's talking about the rule that he's made for himself that dictates that he can't think about things that will happen after his dad gets back. But in this moment, he's just so joyful and excited that he allows himself one minute of fantasizing about what it's going to be like. It really demonstrates, like, how innocent he is at this point in the series. Like, also, just, like, random literary note. The fact that it says right and left instead of left and right, I think is, like, really fun. Because, I noticed that, too! Yeah, because it, like, makes you slow down. I don't know. I feel like I can sometimes, like, be reading too fast and, like, miss things. And when there's, like, when an author, like, makes a choice like that, it really makes your brain, like, pause and focus more, which I, I appreciate. Yeah, I also noticed that. And I was wondering if there was a reason. I didn't think too much about it, but I did notice that. And it did also make me slow down while mm-hmm. reading it. So as they're flying, below them, Gregor sees the city is fortifying itself. People are streaming toward the palace to take shelter, and torches are being lit everywhere. Gregor asks about the torches, and Vicus explains that the humans need their eyes to fight, but the rats do not, so it's important that the city is well lit. Another thing that I was thinking about, like, when Henry, when Luxa was joking that Henry, like, lit his hair on fire, and then also with, like, all this talk of light and stuff, I was, like, thinking, like, how would they deal with a fire Mm -hmm. in the Underland? Like, yes, most of the palace is stone, right? But... What if, like, you're away from the palace and, like, you're dependent on these torches? Like, something could happen and you're not around, if you're not around water, like, they don't have fire extinguishers, like. Right? Yeah, I don't know why my brain, like, focused on that, but I was like, this is so interesting. Yeah. I'm more interested in how smoky it must be all the time. True. If torches are just burning everywhere, like, wouldn't the palace be full of smoke just because there's torches in the hallways and shit? Yeah, and everybody would have asthma. Oh my god, yeah. As they leave the city, they fly over some fields of grain that are lit by hanging white lamps. Vicus explains that they burn with the gas from the earth and mentions that Gregor's dad had an idea of how they could light the city, too. Gregor asks if an overlander taught them how to do that, and Vicus informs him that they have their own inventors, and because light is so important to them, it's natural they'd come up with a way to harness it. Gregor admits to himself that he was thinking of the Underlanders as sort of backwards because they use swords and stuff, but this reminds him they aren't stupid. On the back of her bat, Solovet is looking at a map. Vicus explains that she's the leader of the Regalian army, and they're forming an attack plan. He goes on to explain how the Regalian government works. So Luxa is going to be queen when she turns 16, which in my opinion is not fucking old enough to rule a nation. <laughs> no. At 16, I was not queen material. Yeah. But until Luxa turns 16, the council is in charge. He says, I am but a humble diplomat who spends his spare time trying to teach prudence to the royal youth. You see how well I succeed. Cut to Luxa and Henry trying to knock each other off their bats. (laughs) Vicus also says, Do not let Solovet's gentle demeanor fool you. In the planning of battles, she is more cunning and wily than a rat. Which is great foreshadowing for what she does in a couple books. But this line is also explicitly comparing her to a rat. So we're getting a hint about the theme of like, who are the bad guys and are the humans and the rats so different after all? And if we're defining rats by their evilness, are we defining humans by their goodness? Because there's definitely some evil humans. 
True. Yeah, I think this whole thing is interesting because he keeps, Gregor just keeps getting his like perceptions or preconceptions challenged. Yeah, I love it. Gregor pulls out the Prophecy of Grey scroll and asks Vicus to walk him through it. So I'm planning to go through the whole prophecy in detail when we get to the end of the book. But for now, we'll just briefly review what Vicus and Gregor talk about here without going too in depth. The first line of the prophecy is a warning to the Regalians. The second line about hunters being hunted refers to the rats being killed on the beach when Gregor tried to escape the Underland. The third line refers to the rats as Nars. And the fourth line introduces the idea of the quest they're about to begin. Gregor asks Vicus if the war is his fault then, because none of this would have happened if he hadn't tried to escape. Vicus just tells him not to think that way, and that the prophecy of Grey trapped him. This doesn't make Gregor feel better. The second stanza of the prophecy describes the Overland Warrior, which Vicus reasons is Gregor because the line, a son of the sun, refers to him being from the Overland and him being a son seeking his father. Vicus says, this is the sort of comedic wordplay Sandwich delighted in. And Gregor says, yeah, he was a funny guy. Ha ha. <laughs> ha ha, the narration <laughs> says. I love whenever Gregor makes a snide remark <laughs> about things. Like, he's just so sarcastic all the time, and the Underlanders don't always catch it, mm -hmm. but it's freaking hilarious. Vicus explains that the May Bring Us Back Light line shows how Sandwich couldn't tell if the warrior would succeed at the quest or not. Gregor thinks the possibility of him failing makes the whole prophecy more plausible. That's the point of, like, <laughs> prophecies. Like, making them seem more plausible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> While also making them more vague. Yep. So they're more plausible. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> He asks what light he's supposed to bring back and if there's, quote, a sacred torch or something. <laughs> but Vicus explains that light is a metaphor for life. The narration says, a metaphor? Gregor thought an actual torch would be easier to bring back. <laughs> Love that line. And how could he bring back some metaphor thing he didn't really understand? Yeah, it's so good. The third stanza describes what creatures will need to come on the quest. So, two over means two overlanders, Gregor and Boots. Two under of royal descent is going to be Luxa and Henry. Two flyers means two bats. That's going to be Ares and Aurora. Two crawlers is two cockroaches. Later we get temp and tick on the quest. And then two spinners means two spiders. And later we're going to get gox and treflex. Gregor and Vicus don't go on to study the rest of the prophecy right now, but the next line of the stanza mentions one gnar, meaning one rat, which is Rip Red, and one lost up ahead, which is Gregor's dad. Vicus tells him they're in the bat's land now to ask for official permission to bring them on the quest. My question is, they don't have to do this for later prophecies in later books. I don't know why Ares and Aurora don't just have free reign over what quests they go on. Because this is the only time we have to go to the bats and ask for their permission to take bats on quests. Yeah, it is kind of weird that, like, I, I suppose it's for, like, technically human, like, desires slash needs. And so, like, I guess it's good to ask the leader of an army if you can use their army for your purposes. But, like... That's true. I mean, yeah, it the the relationship between, like, bonded bats and the like the alliance of the bats and the humans is like really interesting and kind of complex I feel like yeah I guess they just like needed to discuss war plans anyway so mm -hmm. they're like here to do that also mm -hmm. so the group lands on a huge towering stone cylinder to meet with a group of bats Vicus warns Gregor that even though he might not be convinced he's the warrior he needs to act like he is if he wants help on the quest a silvery white bat named Queen Athena greets them and asks if Gregor is the warrior. Realizing that he needs them to help find his dad, he confirms he is, and Athena accepts it. He's emboldened by Athena's faith in him, and he has an internal monologue about how the Underlanders will be telling stories about him for centuries, and then Boots interrupts, and Gregor, quote, the mighty warrior, excused himself and changed a diaper. <laughs> and then the chapter ends. Which yeah, is great. It's so good. It's also like so interesting to me that Athena just like 
accepts it so quickly. I guess it would more speak to like the strength in the like bond between the bats and the humans because like ultimately she's like trusting what the humans say more than what Gregor says, I guess. Right. I don't know. I just keep thinking about what you talked about in the last episode about how like it's much more likely that like Gregor's dad would be the warrior. Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm just like, why did they think so, like, why were they so quick to think that a kid would be the warrior? But at the same time, I think maybe kids grow up faster in the Underland, so. Yeah. Yeah. But that was chapter 12. Do you have any other chapter 12 thoughts? Oh, I do have one thing, like, about uh, Vicus and Gregor talking about the prophecy. It just reminded me of, like, high school lit class when, like, I'm read- you'd be reading a poem and, like, the professor would be like, see this comma? Like, this is what they're doing with the comma. Yeah. And you were like, I mean, I guess, like, sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's definitely the vibe Gregor is giving, mm-hmm. is, like... I don't really understand this, but whatever you say, teach. <laughs> yeah, and but like when I was a kid, I remember I was like, oh my god, this prophecy, because like you have mentioned, Percy Jackson like mm-hmm. has such an emphasis on prophecies as well. Yeah. And they're much more like foretold by the gods, so they seem like a lot more legitimate than these prophecies written by some guy named frickin sandwich like yes <laughs> i mean especially as an adult but as a kid i was reading these and like you know having that background i was like oh wow prophecies cool yeah. um but it really is just like being in high school literature class like <laughs> and I think that that's like what Vicus is doing. Yeah, yeah. He's interpreting a poem that was just written by some guy. Mm-hmm. It's not magic in any way. It's literally just some guy wrote this poem. Mm-hmm. And we're interpreting it based on events that are happening. But there is no inherent connection. Mm-hmm. Like in Percy Jackson, the prophecies are magic. Mm-hmm. And they come true because they're magic. But these aren't magic. They're just mm-hmm. ramblings of this guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I think um, overall, obviously, a really good chapter, packed full of goodies. Um, yeah. And I feel so lucky that this is, like, the first chapter that I'm talking to you about. Like, yes! Such a fun time to come in. It's a great one, because a lot happens in it. Mm-hmm. It's like, we're going to the museum, we're taking off for the quest, we get a little bit of exposition about how regalia works. We're getting a little bit into the prophecy. We see the bats, like, government of the bats, like, the government structure of the bats. Like, there's a little bit about the characters, too, like, Luxa and Henry and... A little bit about Solovet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot here. And we're just gonna get more of it in 13. Mm, Yep. (laughs) Which is a way shorter chapter. Mm Mm-hmm. So it starts with Vicus and Solovet leaving to have a war meeting. Gregor asks if he should come along, mostly because he's uncomfortable being left on the top of a tall pillar surrounded by hundreds of bats, with only Luxa in charge if something goes wrong. But Vicus tells him to stay, and before they leave, Euripides tells Luxa that Gregor is bruising his sides by holding too tightly with his legs when he rides. Luxa conveys this to Gregor and tells him to trust that the bats won't drop him. She says that's the first thing they teach babies about riding bats. Merith jumps in and says it's easier for babies to learn because they aren't afraid of things yet, just like Boots. He says, courage only counts when you can count, and then asks Boots to count, and she can't get to 10 without skipping some numbers, which is super (laughs) cute. Henry picks Boots up and asks her if she wants to ride on the bat. She agrees, and he throws her right over the side of the pillar. Literally just, like, chucks her. (laughs) Yeah, it really shocked me the first time I read it. And it gets me every time that he just picked her up and throws her. Merith chastises Henry, but Luxa is just laughing. Gregor is in complete shock, and he staggers to the edge of the pillar to look down into the darkness. Then he hears Boots giggling above him, and when he looks up, he sees 20 bats doing flips around the cave playing catch with her. Boots is delighted, but Gregor is terrified and demands that they stop. Henry tells Gregor that Boots isn't in any danger and Luxa backs him up, but Gregor expresses fear that Boots is going to think she can jump off anything and be caught. Luxa doesn't understand the problem because she's grown up in a world where that's entirely true, so Gregor shoots back that he doesn't, quote, 
plan on staying in this creepy place forever. Luxa, seeing how upset Gregor is, signals to the bats, and Boots falls back into his arms. Luxa asks what creepy means. Gregor, still upset, goes off on her about how it's creepy to see your baby sister getting tossed around by bats. When Henry tells him it was meant to be entertaining, Gregor says one of my most favorite sarcastic Gregor lines ever, quote, Oh yeah, you guys should open a theme park. You'll have a line stretch from here to the surface. <laughs> I think this exchange between Luxa, Henry, and Gregor is one of the most memorable, memorable scenes in the series. Like, in each book, there are a few iconic scenes that I love getting to every time I reread, and this is definitely one of them. It illustrates perfectly how disconnected Gregor's reality is from the Underlanders. It shows Henry's twisted sense of humor. It contrasts his and Luke's entitlement with Gregor's protectiveness and sensibility. It's just perfect all around. I love this scene so much. Yeah, no, it's really cool. And it makes me think of like the commercialization of the underworld. Like, people would go crazy and probably would pay a lot of money. Yeah, can you imagine if they <laughs> opened a theme park? Yeah, it would be, like, so popular. I mean, it would be like, you know, if we, like, found definitive proof of aliens. I know, And, right? like, you could visit it. Yeah, but easier, because you just have to go underground instead of up in a spaceship. Very true. Yeah, they would have a line stretched from here to the surface. Yeah. <laughs> So Boots wriggles out of Gregor's arms and tries to jump off the pillar again, but Gregor catches her just in time. Luxa and Henry are baffled by how upset he is, and Henry makes fun of him for not being able to trust the bats. Luxa laughs, but Merith just looks embarrassed. I feel so bad for Merith in this scene, because he can't say anything to the royal youth. True. Like, he can't actually tell them to shut up. He just has to, like, sit and watch them bully Gregor, which really sucks. Yeah, and also, this is, like, so terrifying. Like, like that she's just, like, Boots is now suddenly so drawn to jumping off, like, from high things. Yes! If that was my little sister, I would be so oh freaked God. out. Yeah. It just goes to show how different their worlds are. Like, this scene does so much to illustrate just how they don't understand each other at all because of the worlds they grew up in. It's just so different. They can't even, like, interact on the same level. Yeah, and this, like, difference in backgrounds, like, creates huge strife yeah. in this scene. Yeah, this is why it's one of the most iconic scenes to me. There's just so much going on here. There's a lot of layers. So Gregor knows that he's being dared to jump off the pillar, but he also knows Luxa and Henry would delight in seeing him flail around as he fell. He guesses correctly that they hate being ignored, so he just walks away, which is very smart of him. It's a real power move. Luxa gets mad and says she could have him thrown off the pillar. And I think she is actually threatening to kill him in this. Like, she's not serious, but she is saying, like, I could have you killed, which is not true. But, like, that's pretty wild that she is insinuating that. Yeah, it's such an escalation. <laughs> yeah. And just the fact that that's where her mind goes, like... That just seems like such a Henry thought that has gotten into her mind. Like, she wouldn't have gotten that from Vicus. Like, yeah. Yeah, she's such a brat around Henry. So, Gregor invites her to try and throw him off, knowing she'd get in trouble with Vicus if she did, which is an even bigger power move. Henry tells her to leave him, and he says, quote, He is no good to us dead, yet, and even the bats may not be able to compensate for his clumsiness. This is very sinister of him, and I think on the first read, he just comes off as snobby, and he's like a royal brat, but he is literally thinking about killing Gregor in the near future. Like, Luxa was just, like, joking and kind of, like, showing off her royalty, but Henry does actually have plans to kill Gregor at this point, because he's legitimately evil. Yep. So this is, like, a little clue as to what he's thinking about Throwback to Nerissa saying their evil's worse than death. Yes, exactly. Henry and Luxa leap off the pillar like a pair of beautiful birds and fly away on their bats. Merith tells Gregor not to let them bother him and says that they were nicer as kids when their parents were still alive. So we learn that Henry's parents were also killed by rats. This scene also gives us a little bit about the family tree 
which I took notes on because I'm interested in it. So we learn that Luke's father was the king and Henry's father was the king's younger brother. So Luxa is royal on her dad's side, meaning that Vicus, who is on her mom's side, is not part of the royal line. So Henry isn't related to Vicus, which is interesting. I think I had always assumed that Vicus was both of their grandparents, but he's just Luke's grandparent. Mm-hmm. And Vicus is not royal at all. He's literally just a diplomat that's hanging around the palace. I wonder if the council is, like, elected or just appointed. I would imagine it, like, they're all, like, aristocrats. Mm-hmm. They're probably but... all, like, somewhat noble. Like, even if Vicus isn't royalty, he's in that sphere of nobility. Mm-hmm. Merith has a killer line here. He says, When their parents were killed, Nerissa became as frail as glass, Henry as hard as stone. I just love that line. It's so poetic. It really describes them well. Gregor thinks about how he can never hate people very long because he always ends up finding out something sad about them. He cites one time he found out a bully that he hated ended up in the hospital because of violence at home, which is, I don't know, it's very real. It's interesting that that was something that had an effect on Gregor and has stuck with him even though we never learn more about that. But it stuck with Gregor enough to make him think if someone is being mean, it's because of something else happening in their life. And now he's seen that with Luxa and Henry. And it's interesting that he, like, never thinks about this in terms of his own experience. Like, because, like, he's had trauma too. Yeah. And yet he's not mean. That's true. He is not become the same way that these other people in his life have become. But he, like, I think he can see how it would be possible, perhaps. like Yeah, because he does talk about how since his dad disappeared, he's become more closed off and private, and he thinks that that makes him seem stuck up to other kids. Yeah. So I think he does understand that the trauma in his life has changed how people view him. Mm -hmm. and they don't know the full story about him, and he, in turn, also doesn't know the full story about other people's lives. Gregor has a lot of emotional intelligence. I can't remember where that part about being stuck up was, but I remember reading it, and I thought that was really interesting, that, like, because he was closed off, people thought he was stuck up, and I think that happens a lot. Like, I know people in my life that are, like, that had that experience as kids, where they were, like, afraid to connect with people and so they were seen as like arrogant which it's just so interesting I wonder like why our brain Mm -hmm. goes there and good on Susan Collins for like actually like recognizing that and putting that into words because it's not like a I feel like it's not really a correlation that like you would come to unless like you have had experienced that yeah everything that Gregor goes through and the things that he thinks and the reactions that he has to things are so real. Like at first he's really upset by Luxa and Henry and we see his thought process in this chapter of being really angry. He's really shocked at the boots thing and he really has a lot of hatred for Henry and Luxa at the moment. And then as soon as Merith tells him the tragic backstory, he rethinks that. And he kind of like takes a breath and takes a step back and looks at it with a clearer head. And that's something that a lot of us have had to do, I think, of like in the moment we're so overwhelmed by emotions and then we learn new information or we just take a step back and we see it an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Vicus returns and the whole group takes off on the bats to travel to the crawler's land. As they fly, Gregor realizes how tightly he's holding onto Euripides with his legs and loosens up, finding that it's actually easier to ride that way. The chapter ends with Gregor acknowledging that he didn't refuse to jump off the pillar just to make Luxa and Henry upset, but because he was scared to, and everybody knew it. Which is another sign of emotional intelligence, that he can understand and admit that he was scared. And he feels bad about it, but just acknowledging that, like, everyone knows that and he just has to deal with that and keep going. This chapter does so much in so few pages. I I adore this chapter so much. Yeah, and he's really starting to, like, 
grapple with his like excitement and anticipation about maybe being this warrior but then also like recognizing his fear and like how little he knows still you're so right because at the end of the last chapter Mm -hmm. he's thinking like oh yeah maybe i am the warrior maybe they are gonna tell stories about me forever Mm -hmm. and then this is him getting put down and he has to find that middle ground of like he's just a human guy he's just a boy he's a child (laughs) yeah yeah well then lily thank you so much for coming on the podcast this was welcome it was really fun yeah this was an excellent pair of chapters to talk about with you i'm really glad before we wrap up, I do want to give a huge shout out to Tumblr user Quohotos for posting some fan art of the podcast. They have drawn a giant rat and bat in a recording booth and a little glowing sign that says on air. I wish we were actually that high tech and we had a recording booth and a real microphone. But anyway, thank you so much for the art. If you want to see that, head over to returntoregalia.tumblr.com. Next week, we will be covering chapters 14, 15, and 16. Subscribe to the YouTube channel to get notifications when new episodes go up. Follow us on Tumblr, Instagram, and Twitter at Return to Regalia. Thanks for listening, and until next time, fly you high.